Welcome to Café Realist. I am joined by two lovely individuals who are about to tell me about their already successful Kickstarter. Uh, congratulations, Liz and, uh, and Jessica. Thank you. Also, Thank hi. You. Hello. It's, it's been a bit mad. Could you introduce yourselves to our viewers or slash listeners? Yep. Uh, so I'm Liz Gist, I'm uh, Thayden Pronouns, uh, and I am the co-creator of Dreadful Realms, uh, Caverns of the Wise Minister, along with Kat Evans, who cannot join us today because she is writing so very much, uh, not just for this, but for so many other projects that I'm not allowed to know about. Uh, that's me. Oh, mysterious. Uh, Jess, what about you? Uh, I'm Jessica Markram. I'm Angry Nerd Girl down in the chat, and I wrote the Level Zero adventure for the Dreadful Realms Kickstarter that's available for free right now. Great. So do we even need to talk about Dreadful Realms? I mean, you got you reach all your goals now, so isn't that a bit greedy to try to even more enthusiast yeah. D&D to uh, purchase uh, <laughs> your book? Uh, no, no, no. So um, the, the cool thing about it now is that we have so many more ideas, uh, not just for this book, but also for the world it's in. We've already started talking about future dreadful realms that are set within the same world that are just, this world is a mess of, of different, in different ways. Um, there's a lot of different uh, gods meddling with what's going on. There's a lot of different um, things generally that have happened within the world because it's a world that has a lot of magic and a lot of beings within it. So uh, any money that we get, any profits that we get from this uh, Kickstarter will basically fund the next Exorcist Games projects um and we've got other things that we want to do not uh, beyond just dreadful realms so yeah so it, it all goes into the project no shareholders here. yeah uh shareholders no, like the shareholders of of hasbro's it's a dnd 5e uh supplement book setting are there rules uh, tell us uh, tell us what does it actually contain uh dreadful realms uh so the kickstarter at this point uh is for both the setting guide and a levels one to ten advent one, one to eleven adventure path that uh, basically builds on what Jess already started hinting at within her uh, level zero adventure that's available on the Kickstarter page. And the setting guide includes not just lore about this uh, vast underground world uh, set most around the city of Sepulchre and within it. Um, but it also includes a lot of new monsters, uh, new character options, including some subclasses, some uh, several new races. I think we're up to five that we tallied now, <laughs> um, as well as new backgrounds and uh, new mechanics for things like uh, working in the darkness and we're introducing a more robust social mechanic. So yeah, we're, so just it, what, there's a, a ton of stuff in there. <laughs> so just which which bit of this ton of stuff uh, were you involved with? Um, I got started when the setting was still in. They uh, was not unwritten, just a lot of ideas. <laughs> Uh, and I got to kind of take those ideas and introduce them in a short, I think it's like 3,500 words, 4,000 words yeah. adventure uh, that introduces players to different aspects. So there's really cute little uh, life forms in the <laughs> caverns that are called oozettes. And they're basically like really brilliant uh empathic slugs so they can interact with some of them there's little alligator merfolk called the nicks 
and you can have a swim race with them. But also, of course, everything is terrible and things are wrong. And uh, I bring some of that in too. And it was a fun process because while I was writing, some things would be like, oh, no, no, that's not like the way this is right now. And I was like, oh, okay, then this has to change. And uh, I feel like we, I don't know if it's fair to say that we learned together what it was, but by my misinterpreting what it was, they fleshed out more of the world. <laughs> <laughs> On that, um, so in our defense, um, this project started as basically a challenge between us, uh, between Kat and I, myself, to write a book on my birthday weekend, which was 12th of September. Um, and- That's a heck of a project. <laughs> <laughs> We'd originally been thinking like maybe 15,000 words. Uh, and then we, it started growing and growing. And by about Saturday night, we'd written a good chunk. And we'd originally been thinking, okay, this will be a really cool, Ravenloft realm that we can release on DMs Guild. And then we sat down and we were looking at the setting and looking at what we were, we'd written and we were like, this doesn't feel right for like Ravenloft because Ravenloft is incredibly stagnant and kind of designed to be stagnant. Whereas there's a lot within this setting that we were creating that it's unsatisfying for it to remain stagnant and for outsiders to come in and change it because that then introduces some really problematic themes that aren't fun to play with. So we started looking at it as, okay, well, what if- This is that project. Yeah. I didn't realize that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it, it's, it, so we started thinking, okay, well, what can we shift and what can we change? And we started thinking more about the history of the location and um, what it would be like to actually live within it. And so we broke it into its own setting and thought, okay, this is going to be a much bigger project, clearly, and gave ourselves a 40,000 word limit, uh, which has now grown to probably about 50,000 by the time we're done with all the character options and all the other bits and pieces. Um, so it was, a, we, we wrote the majority of it within a month. <laughs> wow. Um, and it was, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's massive. There's a lot of lore. And it's very cool. So I, I read that you have adventures from level one to 11. And from what you were saying, Jess, it sounds like you, you take the players by the end to, to show them everything that is going on in the dreadful realms. Uh, does that mean that it's sort of, um, uh, it's not always used in a positive manner, I personally, personally like it, but is it sort of linear or does your adventures still work in a sandboxy way? What's kind of the tone of, of this campaign that you are writing? Uh, so the campaign itself is something that was one of our first stretch goals. Um, and we have a team of writers uh, that includes uh, Alex Clippinger, uh, James Sambrano, Casey Shu, uh, Alison uh, Huang, and Steffi Van, uh, De Steffi Devan. Um, and so we've had our initial meetings with them about what sort of areas that they want to explore within the setting for those uh, that adventure path, but it's our intention that it's not going to be a, a railroaded thing, but it's also likely to not be the same sort of, you're plopped in a setting and you kind of reach a quest hub that a lot of the um, official campaigns are. Um, Especially where, if you're starting from the level zero, you're from here. Yeah. And this basically, it's like what you all have in common is that you've noticed things that your fellow district folk or villagers or neighbors don't notice, or at least you uh, acknowledge things that they refuse to acknowledge. And that's it, kind of what brings you together. It's a setting that is built on lies. 
and manipulation and people ignoring, conveniently ignoring truths that either they have allowed to be forgotten within their history or that have been hidden from them. Um, and so what the characters do with those truths is really up to the up to each group. Um, with the adventure path, they're going to explore ways in which they can start to actually pull back the curtains and look at what these different groups have within the city have been through, what their actual histories are, as well as how to actually deal with that. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's fair to say it's not going to be just a straight railroad path for them. And even the aftermath is, isn't going to be clean. It isn't going to be um, a, a matter of, yay, you killed the Abla. <laughs> There's an Abla. fine what? now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so it's a matter, it, it, it's more that there is now a power vacuum uh, by the end of the campaign. There is, there are a lot of people who will have been exposed to truths that they aren't ready for or that completely change the nature of, of what they're meant to do. And so it's really, it's up to the groups and up to the DM to decide how that falls out and what takes shape afterwards. It's great that we have these interviews because I'm looking at Jessica. It, it really sounds like uh, Jessica is finding out a lot of information about the dreadful realms <laughs> as we are having this. No, I actually don't know what the adventure path is going to be because I, so I'm excited uh, to read that since I just wrote, it's funny because my little portion was done before the Kickstarter started uh, because the level zero adventure had to be ready on launch because uh Kat and Liz wanted it to be a preview so like download this adventure see if this is something you want to back so I haven't really been involved in the adventure path talks so seeing that uh you know removing the apolith is even a possibility is uh <laughs> Exciting and terrifying to me because I know that that's not something that a lot of people down there want. It's also not a simple task. No. So the book is more than a setting and a, and a series of adventures. It's uh, it's uh, mechanics. It's new classes, new creatures, these sort of things. Uh, I and there's also the the grimness which seems to be a part of the dreadful realms and i was wondering how oh, you had the the two of these meet the the system and the grimness because i have some experience playing with homebrew dungeons and dragon fifth edition adventures or little campaigns in which the game master said oh i want to make everything grim so no there's no short rest anymore and and i'm playing a monk and suddenly actually everything comes to a halt and yeah, and just to grind the, the the system is broken it's not grim it's just broken so i'm very curious to yeah. hear how do you uh support the grimness maybe through the system the classes the thing you you brought uh to the mechanics so short sure, rest sounds terrible <laughs> yeah that, that i can't even like a, i'm like just thinking bad game I love. I play so i, I love so them but i up. left i said okay <laughs> fair <laughs> Like I run um, games for so many warlocks and I can only imagine what would happen if I told them like, no short rest anymore. <laughs> you have two spell slots all day. It's fine. Um, no, it's not that. That's not a solution. Um, That's not what I implied. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> um, uh, a small clarification. I want to say that the setting is dark, but it's not grim or grim dark. And I feel like there's a, a subtle but distinct difference between those things because it's still a world that is full of dangers and full of a lot of wrongness but it's not one where you'll have like violence happening on the streets or um or people being actively abused or enslaved in 
within the city in the way that you would see in, say, Game of Thrones, where people kind of nowadays default to thinking of what's a fantasy grimdark setting? It's not that. Um, what makes it dark is um, a, a lot of different aspects. It's a very moody setting. Um, there's a very claustrophobic feel to it that we've baked into it because you're underground, light actually doesn't have the same power that it does on the surface. Um, one of the mechanics that we're adding is new, is tweaked to darkness rules. So things like a light spell isn't going to fully give you the light that you see and things like dark vision you, you can see but I mean it's it's black and white and you cannot see in total darkness because there's nothing for your eyes to work on um there's also the fact that this is a setting that is literally set within the uh, realm of death um, the underworld in in the setting is the has typically in the past been used as a sort of purgatory where people make their journeys from the point when they die to the point when they reach um, the gardens that are the actual afterlife as a journey they they walk th down through the underworld and sort of contemplate on their passing and their lives, and so you have this city that absolutely should not be in there because it's disrupting that flow, and it's causing a lot of problems. And for the the couple of millennia that it's been down there, it has been building on these problems that mean that not everyone who is dead makes it to the underworld. There's actually a group called the Rootless in, within the city that are these souls that don't remember where they're from, don't remember that they're dead. And so they kind of are over time taken over by the underworld. Uh, there's also the fact that once you're gone, you're gone. Um, you can revivify someone because it's basically CPR at the moment. But if they slip away after that one minute has passed, then they are gone. It's funny. I was expecting sort of the opposite because in in the the brief video I, I watch on the, on your Kickstarter. Uh, the the people who make their way to dread to dreadful realms went there to to find uh, following a, some big tragedy to find their their, their lost ones. So I, I was wondering if if it would be the opposite actually, if the players would have opportunities to recover their passed away characters, may probably change the lot, but in some form to continue play them. I mean. I mean... God of Death is down there. Because they might so, find them. Yeah, you can go and search for them. You can go and beg for their return. But in terms of resurrection magic, it doesn't work. It's and you it can kind play of, as a rootless. Yeah, and uh, the level zero adventure deals a lot with the rootless. Which are sorry? Oh, the... uh, they're the uh, sort of dead, but not that they're, they're the not dead. <laughs> the not dead. Um, that yeah. I was just describing the the people who have kind of gotten stalled on their journey to their final resting place because they've come, they've stumbled into sepulchre. So they ha they don't remember who they are. They don't remember the life that they used to live. They're just there and they're kind of adopted into the community. And over time, they actually sort of turn into statues because of that disconnect from the path that they've meant to be following. Um, and there's also a group of dwarves that uh, within the setting are basically agents and 
um, of the God of death that will come and reclaim them when they're found and when they're sort of identified as someone who needs to continue that journey. Is that a, a lot of content you, you shaped or you even created, Jessica, when you inherited the, the, the blob of words no. uh, which you inherited? <laughs> no, I definitely, uh, I was given a list of things that I could hint at and things I was not to touch on. And the things I was not to touch on, I was like, oh, these are all things that I'm learning right now, but that sure is cool. <laughs> uh, and the things that I could hint at, uh, one that was fascinating to me was the stone dwarves. And I was like, that's my adventure. Uh, is that one of your friends is missing. And we added, uh, we, we, me, I wrote a festival and uh, basically that... Um, it uh, takes place at a festival where the it's a coming of age ceremony where everyone gets their assigned role because everyone in this one district has like, to keep it running smoothly, everyone has uh, the job that they're supposed to do. It's the best thing for them. And because it's chosen, you know, of course it's the best uh, because you might make a bad choice for yourself. And, um, someone who is supposed to be chosen um, or, you know, aging up is not there. And the players are the only ones who seem to notice. So it's a lot about, it seems, uh, as you were saying, lies and, and people unwilling to, to stare at the truth uh, too, uh, too directly. Yeah. In the live play we did on my Twitch channel, uh, we did have a content warning for gaslighting. I would recommend safety tools for this, like yep. I do for anything. But something the players kept bringing up again was that they felt like they were gaslighting themselves, which I thought was really interesting because they would uh, find some information and be like, that's not true. I'm not supposed to know that kind of thing and move it, uh, try and suppress the information particularly yeah. uh, one character who was religious. Oh, wow. So It was so much fun to watch. And everyone was in tears by the end, which is always what you want to see, honestly. <laughs> so would you, I guess it, it's up to the players and the, the, the game masters, but would you personally recommend, uh, probably not to the, the end of it becoming PvP, but... Uh, players from keeping uh, secrets from one another i know it's it's sometimes controversial with uh, with game masters uh, whether or not uh, you should have twists and secrets uh, among players and uh, game masters well, what what's what do you feel about that in the in the the setting uh, provided the the appropriate safety tools are are used and people are, are doing that not to to trick people but for for their enjoyment to surprise them uh is it something you would recommend or would you deal with it yourself uh, dungeon mastering that so it's i feel like that sort of thing is very much something that groups need to discuss up front if they are open to it i've had groups where we've sat around the table and gone nope or it's fine but we will discuss it out of character first we as players need to know what your characters are planning in order to make sure that not only that everyone can stay safe and comfortable, but also, you know, to, to make sure that it remains a satisfying story that we're telling together. And that's what I would recommend for every group as well. Um, we actually have a section that is devoted to discussing safety tools, and especially because manipulation and gaslighting are such a central part of uh, exploring the setting. Um, there's also, points where characters might not actually be on the same side of things because we have uh, one of the new mechanics we're introducing is social standing where you have um, a, a, an actually sort of ranked uh, standing within different groups and different factions as you meet them and so there are going to be times where say a next player um, 
is going to have a, a strong social standing within you know their people but another player might be one of the cave elves who traditionally don't always get along with the mix because they have this uh, sort of combatancy of which group is the most favored of the wise minister and there's going to be times where choices are going to serve one group more than another and so it's up to the players to decide how much they want to lean on to those that social standing um as well as risking growing well worsening a social standing for another group by the choices that you make and there's also going to be a lot of times where players are going to need to tap out and discuss out of character okay this is what's happening are we okay with this and is it fine that we continue this whether it's in the middle of a scene or after a scene has occurred or as soon as you realize that it's going to occur whenever you feel like you need to do it just tap out and have that conversation jessica is that all you dealt with things uh, what was this something you lean into uh, during the live play uh i think we did have a moment where was it that where we did um a pvp like manipulate or manipulation is not a dnd skill <laughs> persuasion or something check uh bluff ch wow i am all pugmire in my brain right now um <laughs> deception check but we did check on screen when we were like are we okay with doing this is this something that we want to do um and the players were like yeah let's go with it uh but again i am with liz i always stress safety tools you don't you're not having fun unless you're playing safely like it's not comfortable especially when you're getting into things that are very close to real life like obviously we're oh no we lost Liz. oh no and, and my obs is all over the place now <laughs> keep on talking <laughs> okay i was gonna say uh you know we obviously don't live in uh a underground en route to uh the the god of death or the, the realm of death, but a lot of us deal with manipulation and gaslighting in the real life. And those are things that I think it's particularly important to be careful about uh, when you're role-playing. I do think uh, back in the before times, before all TTRPGs were pretty much online only, uh, I used to play some games with players where we did a lot of like jotting things down on note cards and passing them so that the DM could have like secret messages or players could have secret messages between each other. And I think this setting would work very well for that style of play if that's something that everyone is on board with because that is something that everyone needs to be on board with. Speaking of people on board and changing the, the subject to something maybe a, a bit lighter, uh, you assembled a fantastic cast of people, I believe. Can you tell us uh, about the people involved uh, in the, the wider team, uh, who they are and uh, what's their role, what they're working on as part of the project? Oh, yeah. Uh, for the live play, I had two of the writers on there, uh, Casey Shi and Allison Huang. Uh, first, Kat and Liz had asked all of the, everyone in the adventure path who wanted to, uh, like gave them first shot at being on the live play. And those were the two who were interested. And then, so I kind of made sure to arrange the schedule <laughs> around them. And uh, I was really excited that they could both play. And then uh, Allison is in Australia. So I really, her schedule kind of set when we could play it because I didn't want to be scheduling it at a time that was, you know, like four in the morning for her. Uh, 
so apart from that, um, we had Vic, who I used to play with on uh, Sigil Spotlights channel, and he's a wonderful writer, uh, wrote an orc and um, an elf had a baby on the DMs Guild and a couple other things that are really phenomenal. Alan Johnson is someone that was in my Pugmire campaign for three seasons and uh, wrote in Book of Seasons and is just a joy to DM for. And um, I'm blanking on the <laughs> other person. So that's the was, team for your- there, Christina, you of course, it was Christina. Uh, who I played, uh, who is a wonderful writer and player. Uh, they played uh, in my Princesses Save Dragons campaign, they played uh, a version of Mama Coco as uh, like a cooking bard, <laughs> paladin uh, type person, and, or bard, a cleric, and uh, also guests occasionally on Three Flings and is just a joy to run games for. So that group had never played together before, but uh, they worked really well together. And um, it was cool playing with a group of all writers. <laughs> so that live play is still available on YouTube, on Twitch? Uh, where can it be? Yeah, from? it's on my Twitch and it's on my YouTube as well. It's going to be linked on the uh, Kickstarter page, I think, but it's not yet. Uh, but it should still be on my Twitch page. I will ask you for a link and uh, I will include it in the, the description of the episode so, so people can uh, yeah. can I find like, it I there. Can... But that's the team. I can get that. <laughs> that's the team for the live play. My question was actually the team, the writing team, the people writing Dreadful Realm. Oh, God. It's fine. It's fine. Sorry. It's interesting as well. I don't even... <laughs> we that lost was Liz. all that's a Liz question. That's a Liz question. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> and Liz answered that uh I think earlier. There's the link to the live play. Um yeah, Allison and Casey and Alex Cliffinger, Steffi DeGraff, James, Cat and Liz themselves, and I I I don't know. Who else is working on it? But they're all. I I should just look at the Kickstarter, and I could tell you well, who's on it. Otherwise, tell me what would be. That was a list question. Then, what would be the most Jessica question for me to ask? <laughs> oh, I'm like, when is Liz coming back? What happened? I'm, I'm checking if uh, she's blocked into. No, it doesn't seem that uh, she's waiting to. To gain access, I don't know what happened. They. Say let's use this they them pronouns. Um, oh, sorry about that. I mean, that. I can talk about how much Allison rocks. <laughs> yeah, go uh, ahead. Yeah, I've, Allison's great. Uh, she's won two Ennies. She's a fantastic writer and a joy to play with. If you ever get the chance, uh, hire her. She's great. <laughs> So what is Alison working on specifically uh, for Dreadful Realms? Sorry, what was that? Do, do you know what Alison is, is doing exactly for Dreadful Realms? Yes. She is uh, working on the adventure path and I think she's doing the like levels one through three. Uh, she's doing the early parts of the adventure. Cool. Oh, what can I, what else can I, can I ask? <laughs> it's like, Casey's great. She writes on Soulbound. Oh, oh. Liz lost uh, their Wi-Fi. That's what happened. At least we, we know. Okay. Hopefully she, she'll be back with us uh, in a bit. Uh, I don't know. What was your favorite bit uh, of the setting? If it doesn't spoil uh, an adventure uh, beyond the festival and, and the dwarves. Um, ooh. I really like how much there are things that um, people don't, I mean, I like that the whole world is built on lies. I like that vibe that there are things that either people know, but suppress 
or they don't know and could ask or find out, but don't because it would cause other difficult questions to be raised. It's very different from the real world. Liz is answering questions. Uh, <laughs> they said they had worked with everyone before and wanted to make sure they had a diverse team of writers they knew could handle the setting in a sensitive and thoughtful way while building an elements and life they'd never considered. Yeah, and uh, uh, the Liz Pauscat uh, is writing in the chat room. Liz is still having internet issues, but is trying to get back online uh, ASAP. Uh, I'm sure they will be back with us uh, sooner. No, no, no worries. Uh. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I'm... And the writers are Allison Huang, Casey Shi, Steffi Devan, Alex Klippinger, and James Sombrano. I'm uh, I'm freezing myself because I was explaining before we start. Uh, I was on a stream till uh, well past one a.m. this morning as part of a French online convention. I recommend people go check uh, uh, the panels. Uh, they probably are available with, with subtitles, but all of that wa was in French. Uh, so what did you find of the community's answer to, to your project? Obviously, you you met all your your goals, so I imagine your you're very happy about it, but did you add uh, any specific So exciting. Feedback? There's going to be such amazing art in this project. I love a project of great art. Liz is doing some art. David Markuski, who is a phenomenal artist, is doing a lot of art. I know they have some really talented map makers, uh, and they met their goal for like more art and more maps. And uh, I'm, I'm really proud of them. <laughs> Any pieces of art you especially like? Or something you wrote maybe which became a, a visual and suddenly you get it, it comes to life to you? Um, that first piece that actually Liz used as an advertisement of the cave elf uh, that you had on the first screen was so evocative to me. And I had seen that before I joined the project. And I was like, oh, that's one of my favorite pieces you've done like ever. And then when I got hired to work on Dreadful Realms and I was like, oh, I'm ready for that. That is really cool. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that to me said uh, so much. And let's just say David's art of the city is their favorite. In the city actually, I was wondering, uh, it's called Sip. Sepulchre, uh, am I right? Sepulcher. Sepulcher. This is sepulcher. Uh, yeah, I was pronouncing it in French. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what is the city like? Uh, what is going on there? Or, or does it work? I'm very curious as a uh, watch out, architect and urban designer. So uh, I will be very critical and compare it to real life uh, <laughs> situation. No, so I won't. But uh... there's several different districts. There's um a wealthy district, of course, that uh, if Liz, is feel, Liz and Kat, feel free to call me out if I'm wrong or just come back yeah, into the Zoom. Come back, Liz. Uh, <laughs> that uh, there's a wealthy district that's sort of a gated community. There is uh, the area where the level zero adventure takes place that's called the rest district because it's where the rest of the people live uh there's a place oh right not wealthy because there's no currency it's a barter system and there's uh the fades which is where the rootless go when they uh kind of lose touch entirely with their humanity and they just kind of go there to fade away uh you get to go there maybe in the level zero adventure it's where it ends but i guess um, i mean no one's forcing you to go it's a lot uh, of the adventures taking place within the cities or is it a very yes. urban ad uh, campaign then yes there's also uh the shrieking caves and the alabaster forest outside uh and i love them i wanted to get to explore them 
So I'm excited to see what goes on in the adventure path there because um, my portion was to introduce people to the world and we were starting from a small, like you're from here, this is what's going on, get to know your district. And I <laughs> couldn't really be like, okay, you're in your district. Here's what this district looks like and this other district. And now we're gonna go to a shrieking cave and see what's going on with uh, some stuff that you really shouldn't learn until way down the line. But the, the shrieking caves are very cool. So since it's quite urban, it's, it's kind of something I, I always wonder about. Of course, there, there are uh, commercial incentives, I imagine, to of doing a 5e project, but was there ever the temptation of, uh, uh, do, I don't know, doing something for G the Dark or doing your own custom system for, for this specific project? Of course, it's a complete different in the ever, but was there ever the temptation to, to do that, to, to fit even more uh, the tone of what the story you wanted to tell? That's a Liz question, but <laughs> no. I, would, I would guess that since it started as a Ravenloft adventure, they wanted to keep it 5e in that regard. But because it is an urban adventure, I think, oh, Liz is here. <laughs> yeah, I'm back. Great. I, say, I think it could work with Forge in the Dark. But I don't. Yeah. Know. Hey. Hi. Now I can stop answering for you. I'm back. Uh, I was peddling here, trying to I find questions. I've ended up just hot spotting myself from my phone. Oh no. <laughs> just yeah, like so here's what I think the answer is. <laughs> Sorry, our internet just decided nope. I, I kept coming up with questions and then Jesse would tell me. No, that's a Liz question. I was like, I, don't know. <laughs> I didn't want to just lie. <laughs> Be like, well, yes, I have. know the answer. Uh, I come back and Jess has just changed the setting completely. <laughs> yeah. So it's full of cats and they're all pink and uh, they do magic. Oh, so I, I really see it. It's not grim at all now. It's just pink cards no. in the dark. But if I you mean, don't... some of them mind control you, yeah. but... And I get it now. Like so, okay, you got dark vision, but it's black and white. So the cats oh, no. are not pink in the dark. So how do you sort no. the blue cats from the pink cats? You, you don't know. <laughs> Oh no, what have I done? I was specifically instructed to not put a cat in my village. <laughs> <Really? laughs> yes. it, it's one of Jess's trademarks and we love her very much for it, but <laughs> there's a certain tone in which a random cat emits. <laughs> okay, great. Now I know in the future oh. questions for Jessica are questions with cats so i will go <laughs> this way next time uh i was asking kind of uh of the slightly mean question of uh since apparently a, a large chunk of the the campaign is urban and i mean overall in general uh beyond the obvious commercial incentives uh why is it a f fifth edition game rather than a system of your own or a forge in the dark or, or something else or or did you find that dungeons and fifth fifth edition at least as a as a system uh was fitting for for what you had in mind uh, with this project so uh like i said initially we've been thinking uh of publishing it as a ravenoff domain on uh dm skills and so we uh, never really thought about shifting settings, uh, shifting systems for it once we've moved it out of Ravenloft and off the DM skilled. Um, but I think it's a system that has so much flexibility and can really be whatever each group or each setting allows it to be. And we wanted, we're both big fans of urban settings and urban adventures and so there was a certain challenge of we liked the potential of dra of dragon heist but felt let down by a lot of it and so we wanted to be like okay how do we make a good 
satisfying urban setting uh, for adventures within a city that will actually allow the system to thrive while also keeping it in a very different field than say your average um, go and slay a dragon up the mountain sort of campaign. So the project, uh, nothing entirely aware of it, it works, but that means that the project won't be available on the DMs Guild now. It's it's really a standalone thing no. which you purchase elsewhere. Yeah. yeah, it'll likely be on drive through and possibly itch and once we create it, it'll be available on the Excessus Games storefront. Um, but that's down the line. <laughs> <laughs> so I was asking Jessica a question, which uh, I was told is a Liz question. Uh, what can you tell us about the, the dream team you <laughs> assembled for the, the project? Uh, who are they and uh, what specific things were they I'm enrolled for? So I just extolled the wonder. That I'm so has. excited about them. Um, <laughs> so these are the teams, the team that we've assembled. Um, we personally went to each of them and asked, will you be in this? And we, um, Kat had worked with uh, Casey and James and Steffi uh, before, and we had both worked with Allison and uh, I had worked with Alex and we were both familiar with all of their works. Um, I'd also worked with Steffi, but from an art direction uh, perspective on Masks of Theros, which is a uh, Theros can, uh, adventure path. Um, but uh, we knew that each of them had similar styles of working and similar uh, tones while each bringing a very different perspective and a very different approach to working on uh, material. And so we thought, okay, this is a team that one should gel together, which is so critical for groups um, and a team where everyone will bring their own individual ideas uh, for how to work within the setting and how to expand it for players to explore in this adventure path. Um, we also knew that they were going to be people who had, um, many of them had worked with very difficult uh, topics before. Um, so again, something that a team who could work really sensitively with the material and with the setting and not just sort of string the players along in a way that would be really unsatisfying or actively damaging to play through. Um, and there's also uh, James especially, I'm so excited because he, uh, they are a, um, a historian for indigenous and native cultures within America, uh, the Americas. And so as soon as we started describing uh, different parts of the setting in our first meeting, they were already messaging us with all of these ideas for uh, ways in which the mix's history sort of parallel, accidentally uh, paralleled, um, I believe it was uh, Mayan mythology and things like that. And uh, there were already discussions of things like, um, uh the the sewer demon uh the monsters that are used uh in the sewers and um ways in which food be suddenly becomes an important part uh aspect of some of the cultures and so it's a, it's a group that i'm really excited for um they have uh as a team they have worked across uh, so much of the industry. Um, Steffi has uh, is the creator of the game Legend Law for Onyx Path, um, and has also written quite a bit for Vampire and uh, other Onyx Path, uh, well, Onyx Path White Wolf uh, systems. Uh, James has also worked for uh, Onyx Path games, including uh, working on the new Werewolf edition. Um, which is where 
Kat met them. Um, Casey has worked on quite a lot of um, Cubicle 7 adventures uh, alongside Kat and Jess. And Alex is uh, has worked for places like Peterson Games and uh, is fairly prominent on the DM skills, um, especially when it comes to things like horror. And Draz has Draz is just all over the DM skill community, uh, both doing art and writing and being just the best community manager around. Um, I heard Draz and- described as the queen of the Australian game jam scene. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And I think she probably is. Not that I am in Australia and like <laughs> know that, but <laughs> she has the in on every game jam and could probably write a book on how to participate in them. She, yeah. she knows itch so well. <laughs> and she makes like both video games and tabletop games. Oh, wow. Sure. So she, she's got it all done. Huh? She's yeah. like stupid talented. <laughs> There's honestly a, a mind boggling amount of experience within this team. Like I'm coming into it as someone who like does this still mostly as a hobby. Um, compared to how much time I spend in my real work. Um, I'm not You're that selling known. yourself short. <laughs> I'm not that known as a writer for, for uh, D&D or tabletop. I'm mostly known as an artist. It's okay. I'll, I'll um, and an editor. <laughs> and, and an editor. Uh, but, oh gosh, I edited so much on my page. It's not random. <laughs> um, <laughs> You were like, but, you and Pat um, were the editors in chief of Book of Seasons. Yes. Uh, but even so, um, compared to people who have started doing this very professionally as either a full time career like Kat or as um, a, a part time but significant portion of uh, their time spent, people like Alex or Allison, I'm just like, hi. I'm here. <laughs> so what's the road ahead? Uh, the the Kickstarter is ending on the, what's the date when it ends? The 11th? Um, so for the Americas, it's, um, for the Western world, it is the 11th of December. Um, for us here in the UK, it is 3 a.m. on the 12th of December. <laughs> okay. Oh, gosh. We we chose that time because we were like, we're going to be watching it up until it takes down and we kind of want to get the most out of that last day for America because that's where the majority of our backers are and where we knew that they were going to be because that's where Tabletop is currently still the biggest. Um, so we're like, okay, 3 a.m. We usually stay up terribly late on Fridays anyway, so... We'll do it, and then we'll just sleep through Saturday. You'll be doing a mini like you you were last night, so it's it's fine. I'll be painting this mini perfectly, Aww. which is available as the um, as an STL file because this is one of our founders um, for the city, or what is left of them. So for people who don't have the image, uh, Liz uh, was showing a, a beautiful miniature which you go get uh, the STL file for so we can 3D print uh, it uh, at yes. home. What's the, the road ahead like uh, beyond the, that point? Uh, yeah, what are the, the sort of milestone you set yourself <laughs> uh, and deadlines? So we're hoping to spend, um, so I think Kat has cleared the majority of the schedule so that we can finish all of the extra bits of writing that we have um, in December so that we can then get the setting guide into editing uh, in January. Um, we're aiming for the uh, writers to have their first drafts. Um, we're, we're probably kicking off the adventure path writing in January and uh, they, they have until I believe April, maybe May. April, I'm gonna say. Um, There've been a lot of dates that I've kind of been bouncing around. And so um, <laughs> just <laughs> my brain is a bit jumbled. Um, but yeah, I believe uh, their first drafts are due in uh, 
April. And then it's a matter of getting everything polished and edited and make sure that all of the different uh, pieces fit together. Um, the way that we're doing it is basically that they'll be very closely working together, but also each writer is effectively responsible for two levels. Um, and then the digital release for the setting guide comes out in May, um, Hutchwood. And the uh, physical release of the setting guide and the digital release for the adventure path are September of next year. Great. So Jessica, you got a, a few deadlines there you, you need to meet with, with your writing. My part's already done. Are you I'm done? Good. Yes, you. Jessica's. Yep. You're Jess waiting for your check, and done. that's it. I'm good. <laughs> oh, we paid that <laughs> up front. I've been paid. I paid that as I'm soon good. as I had the money. <laughs> Great. Uh, is there anything else you you like to bring up uh, before we part? Because it, we're almost at the one hour mark. Um, it's a really cool setting and I'm really proud of it. Um, everyone that has seen it has been like, oh my God, this is cool. And I, I feel like it's something that is unique within the settings available because it's a fully new take on exploring the underworld and what that means within a fantasy game. Actually, I had a question uh, uh, for you, Liz. Uh, I know you are from the UK. Uh, I, I, yeah, you're, you're you're you are based in the UK, not just from from the yeah. UK. Uh, I was wondering, uh, provided it's happening, uh, do you think you you would have a, a booth at a convention here in the UK uh, to to sell dreadful realms? Um, wow, it's hard to even imagine a world in which. Things Imagine like dealers calls yeah, a, a world of exist hope. again. <laughs> um, it's very possible, or possible that we would look to sort of piggyback on uh, a more established group, but it would probably be more likely that it would be a 2022 thing because we, unless it's in say the late fall or winter next year, because we won't have the physical books until. Um, September, most likely. And so, um, yeah, there's not much point having a booth for something that is just digital. <laughs> well, hopefully Dragon Meat, <laughs> December 4th, 2021. Yes. So maybe maybe that one. And maybe, yeah. Jessica, you can visit us this way. If we ever get to leave the United States, <laughs> I'd love that. I was just imagining, Liz, if you have a booth uh, for Dreadful Realms and you sell your fat unicorn pins alongside oh my gosh. it. <laughs> Liz designed and sold uh, beautiful pride pins that were very chunky unicorns. Nice. Pride so colors, but they many. don't really match the Dreadful Realms vibe. <laughs> no. We do have pins available but uh, on the Kickstarter, but they're for the seal of the wise minister. Yes, it's very different. Are the unicorns still available to to purchase? Yes, they are on the Myth Makers, which is my own little company store. And the I will um, include the link uh, in the description if you send yeah, it. Yeah, let uh, me just me. find the link. Uh, yeah, and on that, uh, it's it's time to part. Uh, so, uh, Jess, what's what's your your goodbye, and where can you? Where can people find you if you wish to be found? Uh, follow me on Twitter at Miss underscore Jess03. I'm always writing. And I just released, uh, <laughs> don't buy my most recent game. It was a joke. But uh, before oh, that. No, you need I, to tell all about it. <laughs> uh, it was a very silly uh, combination game that's <laughs> was uh for a game jam it's it's very silly but it's called operation necromancy and there's free copies you can go get it but it's basically a storytelling tarot rpg that you play with your cat but um 
get it for free, get a community copy of it. But uh, my most recent actual thing that you can buy is Across the Plains on DMs Guild. I uh, created the subclasses for that. And uh, it's a whole book going through the Feywild. Uh, there's an adventure path, there's a new class and subclasses. And uh, it's worth checking out. Great. Uh, again, click the link in the description. And I will add my affiliate tag. So if people purchase it, they support me uh, a tiny bit <laughs> in my, those times of unemployment and isolation. Uh, Liz, where can, uh, can people <laughs> find you? Uh, you can find me on uh, Twitter at crit underscore Liz, or you can find me on Instagram sporadically uh, at crit Liz, if you're really interested in like customized dolls and things. <laughs> um, and otherwise go back Dreadful Realms uh, Cavern to the Wise Monster on Kickstarter. Great. Uh, question, part of some platforms where I release these will be uh, in a couple of months. Uh, sadly, because backlog, uh, will there be opportunities for late pledges and this sort of things uh, as well? We are hoping so. Uh, we are going to be trialing GameFound as our pledge manager, um, which is a new platform that's kind of a backer kit alternative. Uh, so we should be able to have late pledges through that. But um, yeah. Great. Brilliant. And at well, thanks to everyone who joined us in the chat room. There were quite a, a lot of people, but they, they were not very chatty. Uh, they didn't say <laughs> much. They didn't help me with any questions. Uh, <laughs> next week, uh, we should have someone from the uh, overseas territories from La Réunion. Uh, uh, I hope it's going to happen. Uh, I'm really keen to, to hear from role players in that uh, area of the world, which is a, a bit less discussed. Um, so see you next week. And uh, in the meantime, have good games. Uh, thanks again, uh, Jess and Liz, for, for joining me. And uh, best wishes of success with the, the rest of the, your campaign. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. us. Cheers. Bye.